Amen. You may be seated. If you don't know me, my name is John. Um, I work with the junior high ministry here. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, guys, you guys should be excited about the junior high ministry because you all used to be one. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm going to be taking over, leaving that ministry next year, so I'm excited to be with you guys. I'll be with you guys at Revival during the summer, so that'll be super fun. You guys will probably see me um, acting a fool in some video, so that'll be, that'll be a good time. But hey, if you're like me, you check social media every once in a while. Is that true? You guys check social media? Yeah, well, every single day, every single day that I check social media, for like the last month, I've seen this one thing that's going on all the time. It's that our country, and this country in in Asia are not getting along very well. There's this guy, apparently he leads the country, he's pretty mad at us for some reason. This guy in North Korea, I don't even know what his problem is, but he's upset at us and then our president's upset and all this stuff is going on. And then I've seen more coverage of like North Korean like rallies than I've ever seen in my entire life in like the last week, right? These people standing in stands and and they all look super happy, but it kind of is pretty freaky and like creepy and stuff. It, It freaks me out. And when I see all that, I think one thing, it is good to be an American. Can I get an amen to that? It is good to be an American, yes. All right, we got In-N-Out Burger, got fried chicken, got for the 4th of July. I mean, America's awesome, right? We got the Constitution, it's awesome. But when I look at this book, I see that there's something much better than being an American. There's a citizenship that we have that is far greater than our American citizenship, and that is our citizenship in heaven. And every person who, who has responded to God's call of repentance and faith is now a citizen of heaven. That's what Philippians 3.20 says. And, and in God's word, we've been going through the book of Romans here in True North, and, and we come to Romans chapter 13, and it's kind of an odd chapter. It seems to stand alone, but last week we've been talking about how you are supposed to live as citizens of heaven on earth, right? You're supposed to outdo one another in showing honor. You're supposed to uh, love each other, forgive each other, do all those things. But now we get to Romans chapter 13, and you can open up there. Romans chapter 13 in your Bibles, that's page 948. If you've got one of our Compass Bibles, 948, Romans chapter 13. And Paul continues, and, and he gives some instructions on how we are supposed to live as citizens of heaven in our various earthly kingdoms. So for you and me, that's America. Let's check it out. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Paul's writing to these Christians. Remember, they're in Rome. They're in the center of the empire. It says this in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. So we've talked about how you are supposed to live as a citizen of heaven on earth, but now we're talking about how do we relate to these earthly governments? How do we relate to your earthly authorities that you have placed over you by God? And basically, here it is in a sentence. You're supposed to submit to and honor your leaders, and not only your leaders, but also their rules, because God has put them there in your life. And we really see that right here in verse 1 after it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. It says, for there is no authority except from God. So you need to see that God holds all the authority, right? Jesus said that right before the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says that. So Jesus is the one who holds all the authority. And it says, as we go down in this passage, the authority that people have in your life, that's not their authority alone. It's been given to them by God. And that's the first thing we need to see here. That's point number one. Recognize that God chooses your leaders. Recognize that God chooses your leaders. And if God picks them, and if he chooses them, I think we ought to listen. If God chooses people over our lives, we need to respect them and honor them and listen to them. And that's what this entire text is all about. And we also 
um, from, from a Christian perspective, from a biblical worldview, we, we kind of see what the role of government is in this text. It would be wrong to look at this text without talking about that a little bit. I, be, I mean, basically, in short, Paul says, here's the role of the government. Two things right here. To praise what is good and to punish what is evil. It even says in verse 4, uh, he's God's servant, an avenger, who, who doesn't bear the sword in vain. Right? It says, basically, the government is allowed to, from God's power, kill you if you break the law. That's what it says right here. So you need to see that. And government, in and of itself, is not necessarily a bad thing. And I know that might challenge some of your thinking, but it's true. Government itself is not a bad thing. It's like uh, you guys who are babysitters out there. Any babysitters in the house right now? You guys go over to people's houses, get paid like a lot of money to sit on kids. Anybody do that? Like, I, I don't know why you call it a babysitter. I'm sorry, but I, that's one of my pet peeves. I don't know why you call them babysitters. But we have babysitters in the room. And guys, you remember when you were sat on as a baby, right? You guys remember those times when you were a kid and you had some weirdo come over to your house. And, and sorry, girls, I didn't mean to call you weird. But um, you had some stranger come over to your house or you don't know him very well. Maybe it was grandma and grandpa, but you had a babysitter, right? And think about that. That babysitter has no authority over you, right? In and of themselves, they have no authority over you. They're just some teenage girl from church, right? They, have, they can't tell me what to do, but they can actually because the parents have given that babysitter the authority. They have invested in this person the authority over their lives. So now when you as a kid look at the babysitter, you're supposed to obey the babysitter as if your parent is telling you what to do. Basically, that's the idea. So if you disobey your babysitter, you're really disobeying your parents who put that authority in your life. And here's the thing, guys. We all have babysitters. We still do. Even if you are a babysitter, you have babysitters. That's what Paul says. Who are your leaders? Who are the people that God has put in your life that, that are the authorities in your life? Well, let's, let's identify some of those people before we get any further. You've got to recognize that you still got some, some babysitters, and that's not a bad thing. And, I mean, one of the things right here is super clear, the government. The government is your babysitter, right? To, to be frank, that's what it says, right? The governing authorities. But more than that, you've got your teachers, right? You've got your coaches, your bosses, if you work, those are all your authorities, people who have been put over you um, by God. What about your parents? Those are two authority figures you got to um, respect and honor. Your pastors, those have been chosen, hand-chosen by God to be over you uh, and do ministry with you, your pastors. What about your small group leaders, right? It, it doesn't take long to identify and get some of those faces in your mind. Think about who are my leaders? Who are the authorities in my life? Before we get any further you got to identify who those babysitters are in your life. See, as I mentioned before, government is not a bad thing. And if it was, Paul would tell us right here. If there's any chance for Paul to say, yeah, the government, it's terrible. Everything about it is terrible. It should never exist. No, he would say it right here, but he doesn't. But that doesn't mean that governments don't do bad things. See, government itself isn't a bad thing, but governments can do bad things. And all throughout the Bible, there are some instances where the government is doing a bad thing and the people don't respond well. The people of God, the obedient ones, have some form of civil disobedience. So I'm not saying this passage completely blocks that out completely because it doesn't. We see throughout all of Scripture there are examples. There's four of them that I want to look at this morning. The first one comes in Exodus. Exodus chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but just write it down. Exodus chapter 1, it's a story of these Hebrew midwives. They're these Hebrews who, who help deliver kids. That's what a midwife is. I didn't find that out until I was like 12. Um, midwives, Hebrew midwives, right? And they're called to kill the Hebrew babies, right? The Pharaoh says, hey, look, too many Israelites in here. Let's just kill the males. Sorry, dudes, you're dead, okay? Girls, you can live. That's fine. That's what Pharaoh says. So kill all the Hebrew males. But it says in Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, it says, but the midwives feared God. And did not do as the king commanded them, but, met, but let all the male children live. So they were commanded to do something that they knew was wrong. But even think about this. Those Hebrew midwives, what scripture could they turn to to say, yeah, you know what? God says murder is wrong. They had none. This was before any scripture was recorded. This was even before God revealed his personal name, the Lord, Yahweh. This is two chapters before that. Moses hasn't written anything down. They have it in their consciences, in their hearts. They knew it was wrong to kill, 
right? So just because your leaders say something and maybe it's not specifically told in the Bible, don't do this with your conscience that is really instructed by the word of God and helped out more, you should be able to make those decisions. It's not an everyday thing. It's a rare occasion, but it certainly is one we need to think about. You know what's interesting about this, this passage in Exodus 1? They're midwives, and they couldn't have kids, and that was kind of a sad thing, and they worked as midwives because of that. And God said that because they feared him, because they disobeyed the king, he actually blessed them with children. He blessed them with families because they chose to fear God rather than fear the Pharaoh. The second example is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's in Daniel chapter 3. You can write that down. Daniel chapter 3 in, in verse 16. After Nebuchadnezzar has said, hey guys, I know you might not want to do this because you're from a different land, but I built a statue. It's like 90 feet tall and you need to bow down to it. We're going to play some music and then you're going to bow down to the statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, no way, Jose. I mean, that's what they say in, in, in verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, right, if you're going to really throw me in the fiery furnace, which is what ends up happening, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they were instructed by the king. A law had been signed. Bow down. And they don't. And because they don't, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. God saves them, but, but that is something um, to think about. The third one actually comes in the book of Daniel as well. It's the guy named Daniel. He kind of wrote the book, right? Daniel. In, in Daniel chapter 6, um, the, the leaders don't like Daniel, and they're jealous of him, so they sign this law, and they say, you know what, you can't pray to anyone except the king. So if you pray to your God, you're going to be breaking the law. And in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, it says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, so he knew the law was enacted, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees and prayed three times a day and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So Daniel disobeyed the law, but what is this driven by? It's driven by a fear of God rather than a fear of people. And guess what happened? He was thrown into a lion's den. So you got punishment by Pharaoh for one. You've got thrown into a fiery furnace, two. You have thrown into a den of lions, three. And number four comes in the New Testament. It's the apostles in Acts chapter 5. Acts 5, verse 29. You can turn to this one. Acts uh, chapter 5, verse 29. The apostles have just been commanded, hey, don't preach about this Jesus. Don't do it. That's what the leaders say. Uh, and let's see their response in Acts chapter 9, starting in, or Acts chapter 5, rather, starting in verse 29. Acts 5, 29 says this, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So they were instructed, they were told by the law, don't preach the gospel. And he says, we're going to obey God rather than men. If you drop down to verse 40, it says, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So it's the same pattern again. They're instructed, don't do something. Right? Don't preach the gospel, or there will be consequences. And they say, actually, we have to. We're going to obey God rather than men. And because of that, they were beaten and then they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. You see, those four examples are not our everyday examples. They're very extreme cases. They're probably not cases that you'll struggle with in your lifetime, although you might. But in all cases, for one, I mean, they're all driven by a fear of God. A fear of God that surpasses their fear of their earthly authorities. Two, they're not convenient to disobey. See, a lot of us can run a red light and say, guys, it's all right. I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. It's okay. It doesn't matter. I can go 100 on the freeway. Totally cool. I'm under grace. Not under the law. That's not what's happening here. It's not a convenience. They don't do it for the sake of convenience. Yeah, I don't really want to follow that law so God can be my cop out. No, that's not what happens. It's exactly the opposite. It, they um, are actually punished and it costs them a lot to disobey. See, if the babysitter tells you to disobey the parents, that's when you disobey the babysitter. But until your babysitter says, 
yeah, you have to actually disobey God until it gets to that point. The pattern in scripture is to submit to your leaders, even if they're bad leaders, even if they're not the ones that you expect. And we see that in 1 Peter chapter 2. So let's turn there. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13. 1 Peter 2, 13. See, Peter is writing to these people that are being persecuted. They're a persecuted church and they're struggling and he has some words for them. Maybe not the words that you would expect for a guy trying to help these people in a struggling time. He says this in verse 13. It's a parallel passage to Romans 13. It says almost the same thing. It says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, right? So this is government. This is teachers. This is your, your coaches, your parents, your pastors, your small group leaders. This is everyone that you can think of, every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, right? There's the role of government again. They're, they're supposed to praise good and, and punish evil. For this is the will of God. See, there's not many things in Scripture where they say specifically, this is the will of God for your life, right? I can think of one, um, this is the will of God for your life, your sanctification, right? Worshiping God, that's the will of God for your life. Peter says, you know, listening to your teachers, doing your homework when you're supposed to, obeying the traffic laws, that is God's will for your life. I mean, a lot of people want us to know, what's God's will for my life? Well, this is his revealed will for your life. As a Christian, as a citizen of heaven, living in an earthly kingdom, submit, obey, respect, honor. That is the will of God for your life. And it goes on. It gives a reason why. That by doing good, this is the middle of verse 15, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. See, there's going to be people who say, you know what, Christians, that they serve a different king. They serve a different God. I bet they, they don't even respect our authority. And this is saying, no, by, by submitting, this is God's will because it's going to show people that, that you are also a good citizen. And it's going to put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Verse 16, this is a verse we like as Americans. Live as people who are free. Yeah, see, we like that one, right? That's good. Hashtag freedom, right? That's good. Fourth of July right there. Live as people who are free, but this is what he says. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, right? Don't use your freedom and your, your rights as a way that you can go off and sin. That's not what he says. Not as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. See, we do kind of live in a cool country because we do have rights and we do have freedoms. What does this text say we have to do with those freedoms? Live as servants of God, not as a cover up for evil. That's interesting. It goes on. This is the, the highlight right here. Verse 17. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. You guys know who the emperor was at this point? This guy named Nero. Nero. Yeah. He's a bad guy. If you know anything about Nero, you know he's a bad guy. He, um, he came to power when he was 17 years old, which I thought was perfect for True North. He's 17 years old. Con congratulations, you graduated junior year. Now you're the emperor. Awesome. Congratulations. Round of applause, right? That's what this guy does. He's 17 years old, and he becomes the emperor of this vast kingdom, right? The biggest one on the entire planet. 17 years old. But to get there, he, he did have to kill his stepdad. So, you know, that was interesting, right? He killed his stepdad with the help of his mom. Then he kills his stepbrother so that there's no challenge to the throne. Then he gets mad at his mom, kills his mother so that he can have all the power. Then, after he was married to his first wife, kills her, doesn't like her. Second wife, pregnant, stomps on her. She dies, child dies, dead. Two other guys that you might know that Nero killed. This guy named Paul. This guy named Peter. Two authors of this text. Honor the emperor. What's that about? Honor the emperor? I mean, these are two guys. Think about it. Paul is writing Romans. Peter is writing 1 Peter. They're both going to be killed by the emperor. But you're still supposed to honor the emperor. Can we not complain about your leaders? Can we not complain about how bad you think your leaders are? Because it, it doesn't just stop there. Nero was worse than that. He wasn't just a murderer. He was also immoral. He, he was a pedophile. He brought young boys into his court and defiled them. He persecuted Christians. He lit Rome on fire, okay? He lit Rome on fire, blamed it on the Christians, and then persecuted them. You want to know how he persecuted them? He put them in animal skins. He sewed up the animal skins, threw them in the Colosseum, and, and had them torn apart by lions and dogs and bears. And if that's not good enough for you, he dipped some of them in oil, 
put them on a stake in his garden, lit them on fire, and used them as torches as he, as he had his little parties, uh, his garden parties at night. He crucified them. He crucified Peter upside down right next to his wife. Think about that, husband and wife crucified. These are real people. These are the saints of God, our brothers and sisters. This guy killed. But Peter says, honor the emperor. It doesn't matter how good you think they are. It doesn't matter how much respect you think they deserve out of you. Peter says, honor them. Verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Don't just respect those teachers that you think are the cool teachers. Respect the ones that you think are unjust. Do the assignments that you think, this is so lame, this, this is ridiculous. Follow those school rules that you think are, are ridiculous and lame and they don't matter at all. You're still supposed to respect and honor those rules and those leaders. Absolutely. You can't get around that, even if you don't like them. You never see Paul or Peter complain about their circumstances. How often do you complain about your teachers? How often do you complain about your small group leaders not being perfect? How often do you complain about our government? I mean, seriously, think about this. How often do you complain? Philippians 2 says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. I don't see Peter, I don't see Paul complaining about their terrible situation. And trust me, their situation was worse than mine and it was worse than yours by far. You need to see that. It's so important for us to see. See, as we want to submit to our leaders and honor them, one of the big things we can do to honor and submit to our leaders is to actually listen to them and to do what they say. Right? We said we need to honor and submit to them as people specifically, yes, but it takes us a step further. You actually are supposed to do what they tell you to do. You're supposed to follow the rules. And back in our text in Romans chapter 13, that's basically what it says in verse 5. It says, therefore, one must be in subjection, right? He's repeating himself. Be subject, right? Submit. Why? Not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. See, we're supposed to follow the rules and, and do what our teachers and our parents say, whether we like it or not, and whether anyone's watching or not. That's what conscience is all about. To have a good conscience, a, a conscience that is sensitive, is, is to be a person who does the right thing even when no one is watching. That's point number two, follow the rules even when no one is watching. Follow the rules even when no one is watching. Because the interesting thing about that statement is, of course, there actually is someone watching all the time, and it's God himself. Right? God is always watching, so there's really never a time where you are without God watching your life. It's like if you are a babysitter, right? Imagine this. This would be great. Every house should do this, maybe. If you're a babysitter, right? parents set up cameras in every single nook and cranny of the house and see everything that's going on. Could you imagine that, babysitters? You'd have some pretty obedient kids, wouldn't you? If all they did were being watched by mom and dad and it was going to be evaluated later, I mean, that's scary. Some of you are giving me weird looks right now. You're freaked out. Like, what if your parents did that in your house? Like, that would be freaky, right? Imagine, right? Let's imagine some parent does that. Well, that's kind of like it, how it is with God because God not only sees everything, but he knows everything that's going on. He has a camera in every room, so to speak. And not only in every room, he has it in all of your brains. That's scary. Right? You think if you're, you're babysitting some kids and they know that mom and dad are watching, you think they're going to obey you a little bit better? You think that when you tell the kid to stop beating on his sister and you tell her to stop pulling her brother's hair, you think they're going to obey a little bit more? I would hope so, and I think they would, right? And that's how we ought to act, right? Think about Ecclesiastes 12, 14, right? That's the end of that book. It's a cool book. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, it says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. God's going to bring it into judgment, good or evil, every secret thing. You ought to care about what happens in secret. Not only that, Romans chapter 14, verse 12, that's coming up next week, right? Sorry for stepping on you guys. I don't know. Maybe you guys are going to do that next week. But So each one of us must give an account of himself to God. Think about that. You are going to have to stand before dad, so to speak, and he's going to evaluate everything you ever did. He's going to evaluate how you submitted to and honored and followed the rules that your leaders put in place. Right, the wrath of God, right? That's, that's that idea of, of having the cameras everywhere. And God, your heavenly father is going to check up on you. You should care about what you do in secret. But not only that, 
It says, for the sake of conscience. And here's what conscience does. Conscience drives the same way without a cop behind you as it does when there's a cop behind you. That's what conscience does, right? It, it's the idea of, of having the authority in your mind, in the back of your head, and submitting to the laws as if the authority who can punish you is right there watching, right? Maybe this is illustration plus application for you drivers. How do you drive, right? We are in the United States of America. The state of California has certain laws for your driving. Do you listen to them? Do you look at those speed limits and say, actually, those are God's speed limits? How about you use your, your blinker because that's, that's the rules of the road too, right? Now, now, now you feel convicted, right? Now, now the word of God's coming alive to you, right? How do you drive? Seriously, that's so important. How do you drive? As you flash your Compass Bible Church sticker behind you. As you flash the name of Christ behind you. Think about that. This is important stuff, right? We don't talk about this all the time, but this text shows us this. And here's the thing, guys. If you act like people are watching and if you drive like a cop is behind you, then when a cop is behind you, you don't have to hit the brakes, right? You've all had those moments where you're driving, you see a cop, and you hit the brakes. Can, can every driver say that? That has happened to every single one of us before. Yes, amen. Right. If you act like people are watching, and you act with a conscience like God is watching all the time, that means when people do see you, you've got nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed of. That's the idea of above reproach that the leaders are supposed to be, above reproach. means no one can bring a charge against you. That's the same idea. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul, or Paul writes to Timothy in this church, and he says this, let all those who are under the yoke as a bond servant, right? You might feel like that. High school, I feel like a bond servant. Slave, right? That's what this word means. I feel like a slave to my teachers, right? All right, fine. Let every person who's under the yoke as a bond servant regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Right? Doesn't matter if they're good, doesn't matter if they're bad, worthy of all honor. Why? He gives us the reason. So that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Reviled, that means mocked, insulted. Right? See, here's the thing, guys. Your actions with your teachers, the way you submit to your leaders, whether or not you complain about your homework load, that is going to affect either positively or negatively how you can share the gospel with people. It's going to either bring glory and honor to the name of God himself, that's what this text says, to the name of God and to its teaching, right? To the gospel. It's either going to prop it up and make it look good or, or it's going to make it look bad. It's going to make Christians look like hypocrites. That's what it will. I mean, it's hard. See, think about it. Why should anyone listen to you and these rules that you have about some God who's, who's distant to them? Why should anyone listen to you if, if you don't listen to your teachers? Why should anybody listen to you if, if you break the law all the time and you act like you don't care? See, here's the thing. People are going to stop listening to you if you stop submitting. I mean, that should really put it on our hearts. Wow. I mean, how I live is going to change how I can share the gospel with people? Absolutely. Totally. Colossians 3 says something about this. You guys want to turn there. Colossians chapter 3. Um, you guys know this text about working hard for the Lord says some other things in here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. We're going to start there. Colossians 3, 22. Paul's writing again to another church, this town, and tells them to do some things that are pretty hard, especially for us right now. It says bond servants, right? Same word, slaves, high school students, right? That's how you feel. Bond servants, obey in everything. Obey in everything. Not some things, not the ones you want to do, not the rules you want to listen to. Obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, right? Your teachers, your pastors, your leaders. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers. Not just so that you'll not get caught, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Think about that. You're supposed to serve and obey and do your homework for your teachers with sincerity of heart, fearing God. Not just as a people pleaser, just not, you know, so you won't get caught. You don't obey the rules just so you won't get caught. You do it for Christ. And it goes on to say that. Whatever you do, whether you are a high school student in May 2017, it is May. I feel you guys. I'm done with school. Just, I got a full disclosure. I'm done with school. I'm on summer break. So I don't really empathize. But I do sympathize. 
right? It's May, and it's hard. Isn't it hard right now to, to do what your teacher wants you to do? Isn't it hard to respect them and do everything you want to do everything they want you to do? It is hard. It's May. It doesn't feel good. But it says this in verse um, 23. You guys know this one. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Why? Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. See, when you follow the rules, even when no one's watching, you're actually serving Christ. You are serving the Savior who came and died for you. What a privilege that is. Think about that. What a privilege it is to serve the God who, who came and died for you. That should motivate us. And if that doesn't motivate us, this should. It says, knowing that from him, from the Lord, you will receive a reward. Right? If you don't think God's rewards are good, you don't know God enough. If you don't think his rewards are, are, are worth doing anything for, you, you don't know how good God is. Right? We should be motivated by that. If it's not worth it to you, then I don't think you know the goodness of God enough. Because who's your real boss? Who's your real teacher? Who's your real shepherd, pastor? It's Jesus Christ himself. That means when we obey our earthly authorities, we're actually obeying God. And when we honor our earthly authorities, we're actually honoring God. That's what it says back in our text in verse 6, back in Romans 13. It says, for because of this, right, because of the wrath of God and conscience, you also pay taxes. I know we're not paying a ton of taxes right now, but you should. And when time comes, pay taxes, right? Don't skimp on sales tax, I guess. I don't know if that's possible. Is it possible? Skimp on sales tax? Maybe if you buy a car, right, you can, like, say you, your car was less than it really was and you pay less tax. Don't do that, right? Pay your taxes. Pay exactly what you should. It says this after that. For they are, the authorities are ministers of God. It's their job given to them by God, attending to this very thing. Verse 7, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. You need to honor God by honoring your leaders. That's point number three. Honor God by honoring your leaders. Think about it, right? If God chooses your leaders, if God is the one who invests authority in these leaders, that means when you hear them tell you what to do, you're supposed to do it, follow the rules, even when no one's watching. But it also means you need to see giving honor to them as ultimately for God himself, ministers of God. Pay your taxes is basically what it says right here. In those last two words, I want to check them out. Respect and honor. Respect. It comes from the word that we get phobia from. You know what phobias are, right? You're, you're, you're fearful of things, right? That doesn't sound like the word respect. It sounds like the word fear. It's because it is. Some translations say respect. Some say fear. But get, get that word in your mind, fear. Fear to whom fear is owed. You know, we owe our leaders fear. And not a trembling, I'm afraid of you fear, but a fear that drives you to do what they say because you fear the consequences if you don't, not only from them, but also from the God who gave them authority. See, the fear of God himself and the fear of your leaders are totally connected. If you fear God, it's going to ultimately lend to you fearing your leaders. And if you don't fear your leaders, that might mean you don't really fear God all that much. And that's, that's tough, but that's what... The word of God says. Remember back in, in 1 Timothy 2, 17, right before it says honor the emperor, it says fear God, honor the emperor. They're connected. Again, in, in Proverbs, there's this cool little proverb. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21. Proverbs 20, 24, 21. It says this, my son, fear the Lord and the king and do not join with those who do otherwise. I mean, even think about that. The people that you hang out with, your crew, your squad, your posse, the people that you hang with, if you're the only one in that crowd that wants to submit to leaders, they're probably going to stop being your crowd, right? Don't join with those who do otherwise. I mean, I know we hear that from the time we're like in kindergarten, like don't hang out with the bad kids at school, hang out with the good kids. But I mean, it says it right here, right? Don't join with those who do otherwise. Don't join with the people who out of a lack of fear for God will not submit to their leader. Certainly don't be one of those people, but even more than that, don't even join with them. And the second word is honor, right? Respect or fear. Uh, and then the word honor, honor. It, it means to value or to give good praise to something. We're supposed to honor God, praise him, but you're actually supposed to honor 
other people as well, even the people who don't deserve it. I mean, think about how you can honor the government, right? Let's just think about this. How can you honor the government? I think one of them is by obeying the laws, right? By, by not going 90 on the toll road, even though it's the toll road and nobody's ever on it, right? Still don't go 90, right? Maybe, that, maybe that's an application for you. Maybe it, it's don't be such a mocker uh, of our leaders. First Timothy says we're supposed to pray for those in high positions. When's the last time you did that? Pray for the people in power? That's what God says. I mean, uh, we can fall into this, this trap of not honoring our government pretty easily, right? And even more than that, you got coaches and teachers and bosses. Right? That's kind of another category. How can you honor them this week? How can you show them respect and, and fear? I think one of the biggest ways is not complaining about them or about what they say. I mean, think about it. How often do you complain? I mean, really, j- just, just think through your mind. When's the last time I complained? It was probably right before the sermon about something. I don't know. I, if we complain all the time. We, we think it's not a big deal. But that's not honoring our leaders. That's not honoring God by honoring our leaders. It's, it's absolutely not. And here's the thing, guys. Maybe for our, our secular leaders, our, our governments, our, our things, we're just supposed to honor and respect. And that's enough. All right? But God's word says we need to go even a step further for our spiritual leaders. We're actually supposed to love our spiritual leaders. Did you know that? You're supposed to show love to the people who are overseers of your soul, the people who invest in you and pray for you. I mean, think about your parents. Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and mother. You know who that was written to? It's written to adults. It wasn't written to kids. That's not a kid's verse. That's an adult's verse. Honor your father and mother. Parents are for life. They're not for 18 years, and then you forget about them. You're still supposed to honor them. So don't give the excuse, yeah, well, you know, I'm almost 18, or I am 18. doesn't matter. I don't have to honor them anymore. You absolutely do. Right, right? Think about your small group leaders. Think about how much time and effort and prayer they've put in for you. Have you ever thanked them? Have you ever written them a note? Have you ever you know, done something for free for them? I don't know. Bought them a dinner? I don't know. I, I really hope that because of this, you're going to see the need that you have to show your leaders some love. And there's a text that really doesn't get turned too much in church, and I understand why but we're going to turn there right now. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm just going to surprise you. I'm not even telling you what it's about. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Hebrews 13, verse 17. You don't talk about it all that much. I do understand why. That's usually because the pastors and and the people teaching are, are the ones who teach you, but I'm a guest speaker, so I can turn you there. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 17, it says, obey your leaders. This is talking about in the church, obey your leaders and submit to them just like you would a government, just like you would a teacher, but a step further. For they are keeping watch over your souls. Right? Keeping watch over your souls, the word overseer. That can also be translated pastor. How do you treat your pastors, your directors, right? Rod and Andrew, the people who, who spend time in the text trying to exposit it for you. First Timothy says you're supposed to show the people who do the work of preaching and teaching double honor. Double honor. Give them even more honor, even more praise, even more love, double honor. And it says this. Let's finish this verse, right? They're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account, right? They're going to have to give an account for how they lead you. So the least you can do is make it a joy. That's what it says, um, And let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you, right? It's almost a joke, yeah. That would be no advantage to you if you made your pastor's job such a burden that he's groaning and not full of joy. Can you make your pastor's job a joy this week? Right, that's that's what the word of God says. It is our responsibility to make our pastor's life a joy. And not just your pastors, also your small group leaders, right? It applies to them. They're overseers of your souls. I mean, think about how you can show love to your small group leaders this week, right? Can you write them a card? I think Andrew would want a card written to him. He likes to write cards. I've got a card from Andrew. He's got like perfect penmanship, so I don't know. He'd love that. Um, can you buy Pang a meal? I mean, he would like that. I don't know. Uh, no diss on Pang, but I know Pang is always up for some, some food, right? Think about that. Think about your leader and how you can specifically show them love because not only are you supposed to honor and respect, but you're also supposed to love those who out of a love for God, love you. You absolutely need to do that. See, 
as a kid, when you honor your babysitter, you're really honoring your father, your mother, your parents. I can remember a time where um, my brother and I, uh, he's 18 months older than me. He's in college too. Um, we did a little bit less than honoring our babysitter one time. And I think it was grandma. So I thought, she's not going to say anything bad about me. I'm perfect to her. So we, we were bad for some reason. We were usually good kids. And here's the thing. When, like, teenage girls would come over to our house, like, they were really afraid to tell our parents if, if we were bad. They didn't want to tell them. So we got away with everything. So with grandma, I thought this was no different. And I forget what I did, but I did something. And, and Matthew and I, we, we went to bed, and we're like, all right, it's cool. We're good, right? We went to bed. No, no spankings. My parents get home. And it um, doesn't take long for me to hear the big, like, up the stairs, you know what I'm talking about? Has ever happened to you? And dad is coming. And we're like, oh, no, dude, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. He comes into our room, turns on the light, rips our sheets off our bed. We're like six years old. Like, like <laughs> and he just rips them up. Not like rips them up. Like, he just tore them off the bed. And I'm like, you know, a little kid, like, ah. <laughs> and and there's, not, there's nothing scarier than your dad when he's mad when you're like six or seven years old, right? There really is nothing worse than that. And, and he gets us out of bed. And he spanks us. See, I want to honor my heavenly father by the way I submit to my leaders. I I want to show him honor and praise, and I want him to be pleased. I want God to smile on my life because of the way I treat my leaders. Because, like we'll learn next week in Romans 14, 12, every person is going to have to give an account to God. Some are going to suffer loss. That's what 1 Corinthians 3.12 says. Some are going to suffer loss because of how they don't submit to their leaders. I don't want that to be you. I want you to, to obey your father and not be dragged out of bed and spanked, you know? I don't want that for any of you. It was terrible. I still remember it, right? Let's focus on giving our Heavenly Father some glory this week by, by how we submit to our leaders. Let's pray for that as we leave this morning. God, I thank you so much for, for being the God who has chosen to make us citizens of, of your heavenly kingdom. We're so grateful that you would send your son to live a perfect life and then die um, in our place. God, I pray that we would do, I mean, what is the least of our responsibility, which is, is to praise you and give honor to you by honoring our leaders. God, I pray that we would do that faithfully. We wouldn't do that with complaining hearts and minds, that we would do it with joy. God, I pray that we would seek to make those who watch over our souls, their lives, a joy. God, I pray that Pastor Ron and Andrew and all these kids, small group leaders, that that they would just be full of joy this week because all of these students choose um, to make it that way, God. I pray that they would see that ultimately um, as something that's done for you because we are serving you, the Lord Christ. God, so I pray that we do that with, with joyful hearts. I pray all these things in your name. Amen.